Aren't you thankful you're up and around when so many people are sick during this season with various and sundry kinds of ailments? Chicken pox has been rolling through the crowds and also uh, this Taiwan flu or whatever it is, whatever they're experimenting with this year. I'm, I'm convinced that we're the objects of a lot of biological experimentation. A little too pat. See, I'm old enough to remember a good while years back, and we didn't used to have regular epidemics every every year. But if you've noticed, every single winter, without exception, there's two or three strains of brand new, unheard of before viruses, flu, whatever you want to call them. And I personally believe we're the objects of some lovely experimentation. After all, people are just animals anyway, aren't they? A lot of people think that. A lot of the powers that be are pushing this idea. And that's the kind of people who are out to do to destroy the entire world as we know it. And it will be done unless the believers rally and come back to the truths of God. There's no doubt about it. There's nothing else that has enough strength to resist this terrible thing. Are you getting ready for Nimrod's birthday? It's the 25th of this month, and you wouldn't want to miss that. They'll celebrate Nimrod, Semiamorous, and Tammuz, along with the rest of the heathen. Uh, we don't know when Jesus' birthday was, but we're positive it was not in December at all. But we are also very positive that Nimrod's birthday was the 25th of December and always has been. And it's been passed off on the Christians as a lovely and wonderful holiday but, you know, the funny thing is Jesus never did tell us to celebrate his birthday at all. He knew what would happen. He told us to celebrate his death and his resurrection until he comes. Check it out. I've always thought a birthday party was funny. When you went to a birthday party and everybody got birthday presents except the person whose birthday it was. Don't you find that a little strange? Now, am I messing up Santa Claus for you? I hope so. I think Christians ought to have a good time. We can't change the holidays. They're set. And people have time off from work, and I think it's a good time to spend time with your family and enjoy yourself. There's no use feeling guilty about it. The whole uh, business world is recognizing it because, after all, a third of their business for the whole year comes out of that. So it's very lucrative business, and then they get a big chunk out of Easter also. Now, if you're visiting, I hope I'm not shattering any illusions for you. Uh, you know, we buried old Lady Luck right after we barbecued the Easter Bunny around here. And uh, we just believe that Christians have been suckered into a lot of the world's celebrations. Now, like I said, we can't stop the holidays, and I would even want you to try. But it is a time when families can get together, make it a family day, and enjoy the Lord and each other. There's nothing wrong with that. Amen? And there are things that are on sale around this time of the year that are not on sale any other time of the year. And if you want to buy something for somebody, that's fine. But for goodness sakes, don't go say, oh, what are we going to get them? They're going to get us something. We can't spend too much. Oh, we don't want it to be cheap. Oh, what a rat race that is when you spend hundreds of dollars you can't afford to buy a present for somebody you didn't want to anyhow, but you're, afraid the, but you're afraid they bought you one, and then when you got theirs, you thought, well, how tacky. If I'd have known that, I wouldn't have, bought, I wouldn't have spent that much. What a mess that is. What a rat race, huh? And um, so don't, let, don't, don't get caught in the sweep of things, and don't get all bound up in days. The Lord told me years and years ago, pointed out that scripture where Paul said, don't get caught up in the observance of special days and times. People make far too much of things. There are good, good things to record. I mean, you know, for Anna Kessler to stay with Larry for 25 years, that's, that's something to celebrate. I mean, you know, after all, you take a look at Larry sometime and, and you gals, see if you could stick it out. And uh, there, there are days, you know, they're worth, worth mentioning and, you know, they're worth talking about and uh, some of your birthdays are worth remembering how in the thunder did you get this far you know how could you look so old in such a few years and these things 
not the ladies, but the men, you know. But um, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with doing this, but you know what I'm talking about. When people just go overboard and just go, they go bonkers and spend money they can't afford and they end up in debt and, and head over heels and feel guilty if they don't do this and guilty if they do this and, and what a mess. And some people's finances are all bent out of shape for months after the great Christmas rush. And after the, about two weeks, you sweep all the toys out the door that were busted up the first two weeks. They got them, stuff like that. The kids broke them up, nothing flat. They're made to be, they're made to be taken apart and broken. And um, so let's don't, let's don't be caught in. Let's enjoy each other and the Lord. And let's ride on top of these waves and not be caught and swept under them. Like most people. Let's go back to John chapter 17 where we were. The other night, we were talking about the prayer that Jesus prayed before his crucifixion. And he was looking forward to the cross. He looked not saying, oh boy, I'm going to get to go to the cross. But he looked beyond the cross and saw that through the cross he'd be able to ransom the world. And the Bible says he endured the cross despising the shame. And here in the 17th chapter of John, he's praying to the Father... And we uh, stopped on verse 4 and 5 where he said, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work thou gavest me to do. One of the most important things that you'll be able to say at the end of your life, if you can, is I've finished, I've glorified you on earth. I've finished the work that you gave me to do. I've been trying to finish up my work for a good while, and some of you folks are not helping too much. You keep praying for extensions, and I'm busy praying for finishing, and you're, you keep extending extending it. And he said, Now, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, <clears throat> with the glory which I had before the world was. And we spent some time talking about all that Jesus laid aside in order to come to the earth and be the Son of God who would save the earth from their sins. And he prays for the Father to restore to him the glory that he had before and before he came down to the earth. Now verse 6 he said I have manifested thy name now remember he said I've glorified thee on earth and I finished the work you gave me to do and now then he he tells how he's glorified the Lord or the Father and how he's finished the work. He said I have manifested thy name unto men. Now he to manifest means to declare openly or publicly to make a public display and he said I have openly publicly uh, displayed your name under the men you gave me out of the world he didn't didn't do it to everybody but to those that the father had given him he did manifest God's name to them he said thine they were and thou gavest them me and they have kept thy word. Now the ones that the Father gives to the Son will keep his word. That's one way you can know who's who. They'll keep his word. Because he says very positively, these belong to you, Father. Thine they were, and you gave them to me. Now you are a unique love gift from the Father to the Son. And if he were to lose you, as scuzzy as you may be, as useless as you may think you are, and as other people may think you are, if he were to lose you, he would be infinitely poverty stricken throughout eternity. Because you and I are love gifts from the Heavenly Father to his Son. Now, we may not think that's very important, but to God it's tremendously important. To Jesus it's important. This is why he gives us eternal life. And our lives that follow salvation are the things that determine our rewards, not determine salvation. Salvation is determined by relationship to the Father through the Son. And that was bought and paid for at Calvary, and you cannot add nor subtract from that, no matter what you do or fail to do. It's a total gift of grace. And until the roots of grace come in your life... <clears throat> You're going to have a lot of insecurity, a lot of fears that you need not have. People come here many times from many places 
and they marvel at the relative peace and tranquility of the people. Oh, I don't mean we don't have any problems. We bounce up and down like yo-yos sometimes. But basically, the people stay in place and they, they, they stick it out. And people marvel at this because of the relative peace and stability that the people here have. The reason for that is because of the roots that are rooted deep into grace. It's a little hard to understand that or to show somebody. But you have to realize that there are very few churches that are teaching real grace today. They talk about it, but there's not much of it available through their channels. <clears throat> now, if you got saved, you're the recipients of grace, whether you understand it or not. And just because you don't understand grace doesn't mean you haven't received it. But when you understand a little bit about the grace of God and what it has done in your life, it will cause a revolution in your thinking and your whole attitude toward everything in your life. Uh, when Rob brought the message in the last workshop on grace, it caused a tremendous stir. Because a lot of the people in the workshops that came to the workshops came out of churches that do not really teach grace. They talk about it, but they don't really teach it. And he hit the, he hit the nerve when he hit the grace principle that's operating behind everything God is doing. And it, was, it caused a tremendous wave of interest and continue, which to continue to get a lot of good feedback on that from people who are just, it, to them it was unique, it was different. To Hegwish folks, they said, yeah, that's right, you know, that's good. That's, they've always believed that. But you have to realize that most churches are not exposed to the grace of God very much. Most of the time it's works and legalism. And if you're a good girl, then we'll love you. And if you're a bad boy, we won't love you anymore. And that conditional love is always there. Now, the grace of God is a marvelous thing. And the devil hates it. He doesn't understand it. He's never received it. Angels never got any grace. So it's not surprising that Lucifer's eyes are blinded on this subject. He didn't really understand it. You talk about grace, and you talk to uh, lost people about grace, and they don't understand it either. Because they've never been exposed to it. But the grace of God is that marvelous quality of God that he had displayed when he sent his son. When he dealt with angels, he dealt with justice and holiness and righteousness. And his holiness is seen, his justice and his righteousness is clearly seen in his dealings with angels. When Satan led a rebellion of a third of the angels, God's justice, holiness, and righteousness moved in and cut them off and tossed them out of heaven and pass judgment on them that eventually they'd end up in the, and he prepared the lake of fire for the devil and its angels and for those who follow them. Now when it came to human beings, this, is, this explains what happened in the Garden of Eden. When God made Adam and then made Eve, then Satan knew the rules. He said, all I have to do is to get them to break God's law and then guess what? Chop, chop, chop and you're out. And that'll fix that thing up. And if I can't go to heaven, I'm not going to have anybody else going. And so you remember, of course you know the story well, how he deceived Eve. She led her husband into uh, going along with her. Uh, and it was his fault, by the way. He didn't have to. He knew better and did it anyhow. So at any rate, when it was over, the devil stood back and waited for the axe to fall. That fixes that. That's the end of Adam and Eve. That's what he thought. But see, God then came and showed a part of his nature that Satan had never seen, that angels had never glimpsed. There had been no opportunity or occasion for God to display his grace. And his grace came into view when he said, Someday I'll send the Savior. And he made coats of skin covering the failure of his, his creation and they, they couldn't believe it. This is not possible. They're not cut off for eternity. Now, you think about it for a minute. The, the, uh, Satan and his angels must have been filled with fury. It's not fair. That's not how you did us. We got cut off. Now you change the rules. He didn't change the rules. He just opened up a facet of his 
attributes and his character that had never been seen. And in extending grace to these fallen creatures, he, re he revealed grace, love, and mercy that had not been in play when he dealt with the angels at all, who were a separate order of creation. And so Jesus came to more fully reveal what the Father was talking about in Genesis when he said, someday I'll send the Savior. And all through the Old Testament you have the promises that God is going to make right on his name. And all through the, the Old Testament, the devil was working feverishly and continually to cut off the Savior. And when, when he was in the garden, when God told Adam and Eve, someday I'll send the Savior and he'll bruise the serpent's head, Satan said, that's what you think. And you remember, he went after Cain. He got Cain in his sack. And he had Cain kill Abel. And he said, nah, 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 now where's, your, where's the seed coming from? It has to be the seed of Adam and Eve. I got one of them, and he killed the other one. Now you're going to make a murderer, the one to bring the Savior? See, uh, Satan knew the rules, he thought. And God said, toot, toot, here comes Seth. He, pa he passed right by. He bypassed Cain and went right on to Seth. And the devil was out every time. Uh, it's the most amazing thing as you read through Bible history, how the devil would block off what God was doing and say, now I've got it stopped. In the days of Noah, well, in the Tower of Babel, he had everybody working on that stinking thing. Building this tower is probably something to do with astrology, reaching to the stars. And um, when he, and God confused the languages, and they couldn't even finish the thing, couldn't even work together anymore. And uh, when the wickedness, uh, then, then the demons moved in and been to, began to cohabit with women and produced monstrosities, hybrid individuals, half demon, half human. That's what was going on before the flood. That's why I said there were giants in the earth. Giants of intellect. They were smart. They had all the demonic brains. And they did a lot of amazing things. Did you know that demon intelligence can still do amazing things? Did you know that demonic brains are behind a lot of the, the uh, unbelievable inventions and things that we have today? I would scarcely call Mr. Thomas Edison a godly man. He was an atheist extraordinary. But he was certainly, he had a brain that was on, he could sleep two and three hours a night. And the rest of the time he was cranking out things. Some of the other geniuses of the world have been atheists. Albert Einstein, I'm sure, is in hell. But he had a brain that was unbelievable. See, if you sell out to the enemy, you can get things in return. You just... Uh, uh, in the long run, you lose. And you can have the Nobel Peace Prize and everything else here, but you don't have any peace when you leave this earth. So it just depends on what you want. See? So don't, don't get envious at the foolish and the proud and the famous in this world because so many times they have lost everything. They have nothing when they leave this world. Somebody said you didn't bring anything in the world with you and you won't take anything with you when you leave. When you were born from your mother's womb, you didn't have a thing in your hands. When you leave here, you won't have anything in your hands either. The only thing you're going to have is whatever you've sent ahead. When I was a student in college in East Texas, every Wednesday night I used to go out <clears throat> to a little black church way out on the edge of town. They'd invited and send preachers out, and so I'd go out and teach a Bible study out there for them. And I always enjoyed it. They, they had a little nice group of kids and men and women out there, this little church, and they, they would sing. And one of the songs I remember, they sang these spirituals. It's a lot of them I had never heard. And uh, one of them I especially liked, they sang. It was, uh, I got them to sing it almost every night I went out there because I liked it. It talked about, uh, I can't remember how, just how it went now, but the idea was that you're sending up timber for your mansion up in heaven. And it was an old spiritual, and they, they were talking about how important it was to walk with the Lord and be faithful to Jesus now because you were sending up timber for your mansion in the sky. And he, that mansion was built out of whatever you sent. You heard the story, I guess, about the 
lady down here who was very well to do and she went to one of the proper churches and she was a Christian and she did a lot of nicey things and all but she uh, she neglected the main things and her her religious life was mostly social although she was born again she was very shallow and so the story goes she lived in a beautiful home down here and so she dreamed of going to the through the pearly gate into the beautiful white city and her lovely mansion there and sure enough when she died she went to heaven because Jesus blood was sufficient and the angel said uh, well I'll take you and show you your place and she said oh fine I can hardly wait to see it I know it's going to be just gorgeous because I had a lovely house down on earth and I know this one's going to be even prettier than that and uh, so as she walked along she said oh that must be mine she said no no that belongs to so and so who then I never heard of them. Well, anyway, that, that's their house. And she went along and she said, Oh, this must be mine. This is beautiful. This is a lovely. This is just what I want. This has to be mine. I can tell. It's just beautiful. He said, No, as a matter of fact, that's your maid's house. She said, My maid? He said, Oh, yes. That dear lady worked for you for years, but she, was a, she spent a great deal of time in the prayer closet. And while you were doing a little social doodads, she was doing prayer warfare. And she sent up materials. said, see, we build your mansion out of whatever you send up. This is the material she sent. This is what she has. She said, well, where is mine? I said, well, we're almost there. And she said, who lives in that tiny little thing over there? I said, that's yours. She said, I... I I, it couldn't be. He said, that's all you sent, sister. We did the best we could with what you sent. Now, any place in heaven is going to be better than being out of it. That's for sure. But you have to remember there are degrees of reward in heaven. And what you send up is what's going to be. What, what you built your life on is going to matter. And if you have everything down here, don't expect to have everything up there. Hmm? Depends on, it, it would behoove you to learn how to invest your life, your time, your money wisely for the Lord down here. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to live in abject poverty or anything like that. But you do need to be wise in the use of time and material things. <clears throat> and, you know, it would help you to be grateful for what you have. You realize one of the great sins of believers today is ingratitude. We are not grateful for the things God has already done for us. Again, we got the gimmies. When you go to prayer, do you have the gimmies? Give me this, give me that, give me this, give me that, and give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And when we get through, say, Whew, boy, am I tired from all that praying. And the Lord said, well, how about a thank you now and then? Well, you know, yeah, that's thank you. Thanks for everything. But boy, when it's gimme, you can go into detail and get exact, huh? Sometimes we need to just get alone with the Lord and just start thanking him for what we have. Thank him for the things we don't have, some things we don't have. I'm glad I don't have the flu, aren't you? A lot of people sick. You say, oh, well, I walk in divine health. Well, you might, but then again, you might, uh, the enemy might slip through and whop you too. And uh, there's so many things we have to thank the Lord for, and we're, we're so careless about being thankful. Usually, we're, when uh, we begin to be thankful when it's gone. <gasps> oh, I miss it. You never miss the water till the well runs dry. Did you ever have the water go off at your house? Have a water main break? You never dreamed how much water you used. How many times you walked over that faucet and turned it on? Did you? Or did you ever go out someplace where you had to draw a bucket of water out of a big old well every time for every drop of water you used? Boy, could you ever cut back on the use of water, huh? I mean, you learned to use very sparingly. Uh, you could even bathe in less water, you know, if you had to draw every bucket of it, huh? Sometimes we fail thank the Lord for our blessings well he said I have manifested thy name unto the men thou gavest me out of the world thine they were thou gavest them me they have kept thy word now they have known all the things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee he said I have made sure 
that everything that you've given me, that they know they came from you, Father. I have given them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them and have known surely that I keep out from thee, and they have believed that thou hast sent me. Here's marks of believers here. This is the earmarks of a believer. They've been given the words of God. They receive them, and they know that Jesus comes from the Father, and they believe with all their heart that the Father sent the Son. <clears throat> now notice this. I pray for them. That's kind of nice, isn't it? And notice this next statement. I pray not for the world, but for them that thou hast given me, for they are thine. You know, this is significant. Jesus is not praying for the lost world. His prayer ministry is wrapped up in those that the Father has given to him. In Romans, we're told that the Holy Spirit intercedes his prayer ministry. He intercedes for us who are believers with groanings that cannot be uttered. His prayer ministry is taken up in intercession for the believers. Jesus' prayer ministry and intercession is taken up with the believers. Well now who's going to be praying for the world? Who's going to pray for the lost? Guess who? We are. God has deliberately left this job vacant. The Holy Spirit's prayer ministry is centered on the believers. The Son of God's prayer ministry is centered on the believers. And he has left to us the duty, responsibility, and privilege of praying for those that are lost. Now do you understand a little better why you feel this load to pray for your lost loved ones and friends? It's a God-given interest and desire to see them saved. To see them born again. As a matter of fact, if you remember back when you first got saved, if you will remember, most believers, once they knew for sure they were saved, one of the first things they thought after they were sure that they themselves were born again, they thought of somebody, one or two people very close to them, loved ones or friends, that they, ah, I must get this to them. Right? See, one of the first impulses when you get born again, is to think about somebody else that you know who needs to know this same thing. Once it's stabilized in your heart and it's real to you, then you're, because God has put a, a desire in our hearts to pray for those that are lost. Because the Father has given to the Son the ministry of praying for us. He's given to the Holy Spirit the ministry of intercession on behalf of the believers. And the believers then, so prayed for and so empowered, are to thrust forward and pray in Jesus' name for the salvation of the lost. So don't ever say you don't have anything to do. To pray for those closest to you is one of your jobs. And it's a privilege as well. Now he says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them thou hast given me, for they are thine. Verse 10 and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I'm glorified in them. That's kind of neat, you know. He said, all mine are thine. And they're locked in. Isn't that nice? To be in the hand of the Savior. The Father gives them to the Son, and the Son said, they belong to us. And you're locked in. That's kind of a, if you want to be secure now, that's where you find security. You're in the hand of the Savior, and the Father's hand locked over his. And the Holy Spirit seals the whole transaction. You can't get much more secure than that. And that hasn't got anything to do with the rise and fall of nations, with whether you've got a job or haven't, whether you eat a lot or starve to death, that doesn't affect it at all. Whether you're sick or well, doesn't affect it in the slightest. Your status and standing with God are sealed in by the eternal work of the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now that's real security. And we need that because the whole world around us is going crazy. 
they're falling to pieces because everything, everything they trust in, it changes. I mean, you remember when you bought that new car and you trusted in it? Oh, the first time it, you, said, you said, I didn't trust in it. Yes, you did. First time you turned that key and it went, Bang. you thought, I trusted you. You did this. What do you mean? That's why you were so startled when it didn't work. See, unconsciously, you have a lot of faith in a lot of things. Uh, when you go home tonight, we'll let you go home tonight. Uh, then uh, when you walk in your house, it'll be dark. And you reach over and you flip the light switch by the door. And if the light doesn't come on, you're going, what's the matter? And you go flip, 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 flip. Why are you startled? Because you had faith to believe that light was coming on when you hit that switch. You didn't stop and think, now, I have faith to believe that the light will come on when I punch the switch. You didn't stop and analyze that way, but it was built into your thinking, see. See, we, we live by faith all the time. I mean, you have faith to believe these trusses that are holding this roof up are going to hold. If you didn't, you'd be going out the back door, and I'd probably lead the way out this way. If, if we felt like the roof was fixing to give way. I'd say, come this way, folks. Follow me. I'll show you the way. Uh, but uh, that's because we have faith. You're sitting on those benches out there. And if you thought they were going to collapse, you'd, you'd be up on your feet. Right? See, we exercise faith all the time. You men have a great deal of faith. After the way you snap at your wives, then you come in and eat what she cooks. <laughs> she might just slip something in there to help you along, you know. Uh, <clears throat> but... Um, we have faith all the time. We live by faith. Really, there's a lot of things we do by faith. Uh, we, it's unconscious, and we don't realize how, what a common thing it is. As a matter of fact, when uh, children of Israel were back in Egypt getting ready to go, you remember? God said to kill the lamb, catch the blood in a basin, and then he told them to get a bundle of hyssop weed. Now, hyssop was just an old weed, river weed. It grew in the Nile River. And it was available everywhere. Just, you know, anybody could get a... You didn't have to... He didn't say take a golden rod because, my, how, people, how many people could afford a golden rod? He didn't say take a certain kind of wood or anything else. Just get a handful of old hyssop weed out there out of the river bank, off the river bank. Everybody could get that as a common thing, just common as dirt. Those weeds grew everywhere. Get a bundle of hyssop weed and dip it in the blood and strike it over the doorpost and the lentils. Now, see, everything, and that represents faith. The hyssop weed is a picture of faith. It's common. It's used all the time. And everybody could get it, and it didn't cost anything. Anybody could get a hyssop weed and could, therefore, apply the blood. And how is the blood applied, by the way? By faith. The old hyssop weed still works. That's how you get the blood applied to yourself, is by faith. And Romans ten seventeen, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So, uh, Jesus is saying they're all mine and they're all the fathers. They're locked together. Verse 11, now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. I had you noticed you're still in the world? Hmm? Oh, very much so, right? He said, now, I'm not in the world anymore. I've come out of it. But these are in the world, and I come to thee. Remember he told them over in the 14th chapter of John, uh, I'm going away, and your heart's been filled with sorrow. But he said, when I go away, I'll not leave you comfortless, or I'll not leave you orphans, but I'll send the Holy Spirit. If I don't go away, the Holy Spirit won't come. And they couldn't understand. It was hard. They wanted him right there where they could touch him, feel him, hear him. <clears throat> but he said, I'll send you the comforter. The Greek says something like the all-sufficient one. Send the Holy Spirit, who's the all-sufficient one. Well, he said, I'm no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father... Notice his prayer now. Keep through thine own name, not through their works, but keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Did he get his prayers answered, you think? Did anybody ever got his prayers answered? It was Jesus, wasn't it? 
He said, well, he prayed, let this cup pass from me. Well, he was praying to escape death in the garden. That's all he's doing. He got his prayers answered there too. He said, Father, this wasn't the arrangements. I'm not supposed to die in the garden. I'm supposed to die on a cross. But if you've changed your mind and you want to go the other way, that's fine. Let the, thy will be done. He prayed that way, even at the last minute. And he got his prayers answered there too. Well, we're going to have to stop there. And uh, my, this is a rich verse. Got so much in it. So much to bless us with. So much to help us with. And not a demon in the bunch. How about that? But just in case, there might be a few scattered around here needing dealing with. We're coming out of the time when the church becomes a body ministry. If you've never asked Jesus in your heart or you're not sure you have, wouldn't you like to? He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, woman, boy, girl, young person hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. If you've never done this or you're not sure you have, let us urge you and encourage you to receive Jesus this morning. Ask him to come in your heart. If you can't get it settled back at your seat so that you know that you know that you know that he's in your heart, don't hesitate to come down. There'll be somebody receiving people down here just say, I need to talk to somebody about salvation. You say, well, I've done that before. Well, if it's not settled in your heart, you still need to do it, okay? Because until you get your salvation straight and you know your relationship with the Lord is sound, then you can't move further with the Lord, really, because you're too uncertain. Get your foundation sure, then move on. If that's not your problem about your salvation, that's no particular problem, but you are driven, harassed, tormented, and this is producing compulsive behavior, which is slowing down, stopping, or reversing spiritual growth and progress, then by all means... We want you to come and receive help from demons because that's what's causing this. This is the way demons operate. These signs will follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils. We have many people here who can help you with this kind of problem. If you come say, I think I have some demonic problems. I need deliverance. That's all you need to do. And you'll get one-on-one -on -one help in a very short time. Another sign that follows believers, they shall speak with new tongues. If you didn't receive this when you got saved... Let me tell you that it is for you today. It is a gift just like your salvation. You could have it if you desire it. You indicate it when you come forward. Another uh, sign that follows believers, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. If you have physical needs, there are people here who believe that Jesus heals today and will pray for you for your physical needs. So whatever you have need of, we encourage you to come and let the Lord minister to you through his body. Let's stand and sing something about that name as we do if you have a need you come forward and let the body minister to you Jesus Jesus if you're coming for the first time for prayer cut the line come straight down the center and you'll have the first workers if this is your first time to come for prayer come right straight down the center